Let's begin reading here in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. And I'll give you a brief review, and then we'll move on into our study. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3, Solomon says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this also is vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. So as we're going through the book, the book Ecclesiastes, I mentioned to you, but I'll review this with you, that the word Ecclesiastes is the Greek translation of a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word that is being translated, is the word preacher. So the book of Ecclesiastes is literally the book of the preacher. And the preacher is one of the uh, titles of King Solomon. In this particular book, Solomon is actually giving his testimony while preaching a message. Now, often messages have a great impact when a testimony is given. And you can see that, and I took a few moments to develop this as I was thinking about this as an introduction, and you can see that in Scripture. You can see that uh, there are, there's actually a call to give testimony in the Bible. For example, Psalm 66, verse 16, it says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he's done for my soul. He's saying, I want to give a testimony. I want to share, and I'm asking you to come and for you to listen. There's a king in the Bible, he's found in the book of, uh, of Daniel. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he gave a testimony in chapter 4, verse 2, and he said this. The king said, I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. Now, Jesus himself gave testimony. In John 8, 38, he said this. He said, I'm telling you what I've seen in my Father's presence, and you're doing what you've heard from your father. He was speaking to enemies and he said, you're doing things according to your own father, which he is saying is Satan. He gave a testimony in Luke 10 verse 18 when he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When you look in the New Testament, there are writers who speak in such a way as to give testimony. John chapter 1 verse 1, he said it like this, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. He's saying, I have had a personal experience. These are the things I'm testifying about. The apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1.16 said it like this. He said, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When you look into the book of Acts and various other books of the Bible, the Apostle Paul gives his testimony a variety of times. In the book of Acts, we'll be seeing this in chapter 22, in chapter 24, in chapter 26. The Apostle Paul gives the testimony. When he was writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, he gave his testimony, as he did in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 7 through 10. In Galatians 1, 13, reading the scripture, he said it like this. This is his testimony. He said, you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. He's giving testimony. This is who I was. This is what I did. In 1 Timothy 1.13, he said it like this. I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And so you see, testimony after testimony after testimony. And of all who ever lived, Solomon had the greatest, outside of Christ, had the greatest of life's experiences. More than any man, he's able to say life without God is vanity. Throughout the book, he shares that a life not centered on God is futile. That's because he wants us to know the meaning of life. That's why he, why he wrote. He wants us to know what our purpose is, and he makes it clear. Everything that we see is temporary. And we ought to see things that way. The world and all that is in it is winding down. And it shouldn't rule our lives. I, I, on Thanksgiving, uh, 
we have a bit of a family tradition. We go to the auto show on Thanksgiving and look at cars we can't buy. <laughs> but my family's been doing that forever. My, my father, when I was a little boy, took me to the auto show. And when my kids were small, I took them there. And uh, I, I, we do that. And, and you'll see these cars and, and you'll look at a car. Uh, as there was a, uh, for example, uh, there was a Lexus. I forget what it was but its model is, but I do know it costs $108,000. You know, that's almost twice as much as the first house I ever bought. And you can see all these things and these toys and everything. And, and, and some of you, you have scraped, you worked hard, you, you wanted. There's nothing wrong with, by the way, working and, and achieving a, a goal. Nothing wrong, as a matter of fact, it's a good thing. But you discover, after you've had it for a little while, that the smell of that leather eventually wears off. You get tired of going to the gas station and having to fill that thing up. And you begin to realize that this model was nice, but I'm looking forward to the new one. And that's kind of what happens, right? Is you get something, you like something, you buy something, you get tired of something, and you buy something else. Some people do that with cars. Some people do that with people. They marry somebody, get rid of somebody, marry somebody else, get rid of somebody, marry somebody else. They do that over and over and over again. Why? Because they're looking for something that can't be filled by a human being or a material object. And that's basically what we're looking at here. It's like what Paul said again in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 31. The form of this world is passing away. Everything in this world is winding down and therefore should not rule our lives. So we know that man's purpose is greater than accumulating material possessions. And in our quest of possessions... We accumulate the things that end up possessing us. Our society once understood it. Our poets would make it very clear. In many ways, poets were almost prophetic in some ways. They would speak of common experience. They put words to, to that experience that people would memorize. And, and, but they had something they wanted to say. And, and you see that in, um, in, in a lot of songs. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into ancient history for a moment. For some of you too young to know these songs and all of that, but the old ones, you'll kind of remember them or pretend that you do. There was a song, and it's interesting. This may be something that's somewhat current for some who are younger. Uh, there was a song that was brought out by this interesting vocal duo by the name of Simon and Garfunkel. What a name, huh? Who likes the name Simon? But anyway, um, it was called The Sounds of Silence. And I had a young, uh, young man in our fellowship. I actually had a, um, I was going to use this song, not done by Simon and Garfunkel, but a more recent one, and I forget the name of the person who brought it out. Uh, I'll try to remember it even as I'm sharing. But I, I wanted Disturbed. Are you Disturbed? Are you disturbed? Okay. Don't be Disturbed, John. Disturbed. And some of you heard it. It was a, it was a redo. Uh, but I had asked them, take some pictures. I'm going to use it as a, a, a song with pictures that kind of create an image. And at a certain point, they didn't know how to show pictures of this one line. And it was a line that I wanted, I wanted to use where it says, um, the people bowed and prayed to the neon God they made. The people bowed and prayed to the neon God they made. And... Uh, no discredit of my, 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 my guys. I love them very deeply, and they did their best, but they didn't know what that meant because they didn't understand the generation that put together that song. It was speaking about plastic materialism, things that guided people's lives, achievements that had no actual um, fulfillment. And the people bowed and prayed to that. Materialism had become such a great thing in our society that was looked at as being bad that is now cherished and valued even by pastors who preach that you should always have the things that you desire. See, so it's twisted. But the Bible doesn't teach that. There was a song, again, I'll jump into ancient history, that was called Mr. Businessman. Many of you have never even heard of that, but there's a, a line in it I've never forgotten since I first heard it. And, and it's a question. He says this. Uh, it, the, the singer says, did you see your children growing up today? Did you hear the music of their laughter as they set about to play? Did you catch the fragrance of those roses in your garden? Did the morning sunlight warm your soul, brighten up your day? Then he goes on to say, do you qualify to be alive? Or is the limit of your senses 
so as only to survive. Mr. Businessman, you've got it all and you've got nothing. You planted a garden in the backyard. You don't even take the time to smell the roses that you planted. People bowed and prayed to the neon God they made. This ultimately diminishes us. It clouds the purpose that we were created for. Jesus in Luke 12, 15 said it like this. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Our purpose is much higher than the material, than the sensual. It's much higher than having the attention of people. Our purpose is to know and glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Jesus in John 17, 3 said it like this. He said, this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life to have relationship with God. Not to be bound to this earth by the things we possess. So Solomon has made it very clear that life's pursuits without God are vanity. Physical labor, though it may achieve certain things, is still unsatisfying. And because our lives are brief, experience reveals that there's nothing new under the sun without God. Injustice and longing is all you're ever going to experience. And that's what he's been saying, and that's what he said in chapter, chapter 1. But now he continues his thought into chapter, what we call chapter 2. And so he said in verse 1, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Surely... This also was vanity, greatness and wisdom, knowledge, madness, folly. None of that satisfies. The more he knew, the greater the grief and the greater sorrow he experienced. So he's thinking, if these things don't satisfy, well, perhaps pleasure will. I'll try to find satisfaction and pleasure in sensual experience. In other words, I'm going to try to live life as if it's just one long party so he's saying that, he said, whatever I wanted, I made sure I got. After all, I had so much money, I could afford it. So why not have it? You see, obviously, on the one hand, enjoying life is something we were created to do. The Jews rightly understood that God made man to enjoy the blessings of this life. It's part of the fruit of knowing and worshiping him. In Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. Its leaf will be green, will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. I want you to have a blessed and abundant life, God is saying. And God wants us to enjoy the life that he gave us, and he wants us to be blessed. But as he's saying that, notice verse 1, he says, in the end, surely this also is vanity. My quest for knowledge left me unsatisfied as did my quest for pleasure. I said, verse 2, I said of laughter, madness, and mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till, till I might see uh, what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their life. So I searched. I searched my heart. I said of laughter. Even when you're trying to enjoy life, we know this. I'm speaking to people who will understand this. If you're young and haven't learned this, you will. You can have everything you want in life and still be unsatisfied. In Proverbs 14, verse 13, even in laughter, the heart may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be grief. So building your life on the pursuit of pleasure always ends up falling short. Searching for pleasure results in dissatisfaction, whether it's alcohol or drugs, whether it's sex and money, whether it's gambling or fame, whether it's intellectual achievements, all of this will leave you empty. Why? Because these things do not satisfy your spiritual needs. And so he's speaking of that. He says in verse 3, he said, I searched in my heart. How to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom. How to lay hold on folly till I might see what, what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I wanted to yield my flesh to wine while being 
guided by my wisdom. I tried to indulge in alcohol and yet guide my use of alcohol with spiritual wisdom. That's taking place even in our day, by the way, in many churches. There are pastors who enjoy their alcohol and still are trying to guide their lives with spiritual wisdom. Well, Solomon can say that doesn't work. He's saying, I tried living in the flesh and in the spirit, using wine to sweeten and wisdom to guide. In other words, I tried to party and yet remain spiritual at the same time. I wanted to know if I could drink my fill of wine and still be a spiritual person. Could the mixing of the two result in satisfaction in life? I'm drinking wine, and wine is pleasurable, but I have my wisdom, and that's also pleasurable. He says in verse 3, he says, to lay hold on folly until I might see what was good for the sons of men. I, I pursued my flesh. I pursued carnal pleasure, but this is folly. I did it. Because I wanted to know the true way of contentment and satisfaction. By going deeply into these things, I thought I might learn something. He says in verse 4, uh, I, I made my works great. I built myself houses, planted myself vineyards. I, I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. Um, these things that I was trying previous to this didn't satisfy. So I began looking other places. I began massive building projects. I tried to build a paradise on earth as God created Eden. I built massive buildings, planted vineyards and orchards. I had beautiful fruit trees and, and water pools. And I did all of this for my pleasure. I created a landscaper's paradise. But it was empty. Anybody knows that starting a project can be fun and exciting? It can be. Yeah, we're going to do it. We're breaking ground. We've done that many times in this church. Many times. And the first day is always the exciting day. All right, let's do it. I remember when we, we purchased some property. The first property we as a church purchased was on Maple Street in Ontario. And, and I was excited. My, my sons were both little boys and so I brought them to the, um, the building site. We were tearing down some walls. And I am, I'm, not a, I'm not handy with the hammer and the saw. You know, I'm just not. But I thought I'd pretend to be a man for a while. And I, I went to do some destruction because I hear that that's a lot of fun. So I did. I went to this little building that we had. And I still remember, I was telling my son, you know, you can just use a hammer and break this and all. We're tearing this all down. And I still remember going up to this uh, light uh, switch. And I had a hammer, and I peeled it out, and, and two of the wires came out. So I stuck my hand in to remove the box. Yeah, and the wires, one on one side, the other on the other, and I got the shock of my life. I, I still remember just going like that, you know. You could see my skeleton. It was really amazing. <laughs> to kind of show you something, um, I remember pulling my hand out from between these live wires. And my fingernail was on fire. There was a blue fire. And, and you got to remember, I was a hippie. And so I had a flashback. I looked at it going, whoa. I started moving it back and forth. <laughs> then I realized I'm on fire. <laughs> We've done a lot of building projects. The stage that I'm standing on right now, hardly any of, any of you would remember this. We built this stage. This stage actually went to the edge of both sides of the walls here. And, and on one side, on either side here, there are some phony um, stained glass windows that we covered up. And... You know, we ripped up car. We've, we've gone into building project after building project after building project. I can tell you. It's exciting when it begins. But after a while, when is this going to end? I am so tired. We've got to get this done, right? Solomon understood that. He had so many things that he did, so many projects. But there's an emptiness once it's completed. Uh, what's the point? Well, being a workaholic isn't rewarding. And those who are workaholics find retirement 
Very difficult. He said in verse 7, he goes, I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I was wealthier than the wealthiest. That's what he's basically doing here when he, he's speaking of this. I, I have wealth. He, he purchased servants. He had voluntary bond servants. And when the bond servants had their children, the children belonged to Solomon. So I had many. In verse 8, he says, I, I gather for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. I became great, excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. I was wealthy, extremely so. I, I, I received tribute from kings. In 1 Kings, it gives a, a lot of information about Solomon and his wealth. And, and for example, in 1 Kings 9, verse 28, it says, they sailed to Ophir and brought back to Solomon 16 tons of gold. So he had quite a bit of money. Somebody said Solomon inherited wealth from his father David, regularly received gold and silver from the kings of Arabia, governors and merchants, and heavily taxed his own people. Solomon received tribute money from countries and kingdoms, plus gold, silver, ivory, animals, every three years due to his business partnership with the king of Tyre. He garnered gifts of gold, spices, precious stones, garments, armor, and so on each year from a variety of others. He ruled Israel 40 years. We can safely assume his assets were in the multiple billions and billions of dollars. So, are the richest people satisfied? <laughs> no, not if they seek contentment through money. In verse 8, and I want you to see this, I gather for myself silver, gold, special treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, musical instruments of every kind. What is he speaking about? Well, with wine and song came the delights of men. The delights of the sons of men speaks of sexual pleasure. It speaks of his, his harem. First, King, First Kings 11, verses 3 and 4. Listen to this. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. 700 wives, 300 concubines? He ain't that wise. What if they all had PMS? Can you imagine that at the same time? Unbelievable. He knew how to throw a party. In 1 Kings 4, and 23, listen to this. Solomon's daily provisions were about 180 bushels of fine flour daily. 180 bushels of fine flour, about 365 bushels of meal, 10 head of stall-fed cattle, 20 of pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl daily. A bushel weighs 48 pounds. He had 8,640 pounds of fine flour and 17,520 pounds of regular flour daily. And that made a lot, a lot of tortillas. <laughs> this is a guy who, whose meals rivaled the best restaurants were probably surpassing the, the best restaurants. I don't even know what the best restaurants are, so I just came up with a list. I hear that this... There's a place called the French Laundry. Our governor likes it. I hear it's amazing. Lowry's, Ruth's Chris, Fleming's, whatever, whatever you like. He had that every day, every single day. It got kind of 
boring. Not only that, he had the best wine, the best entertainment, and the great, greatest luxurious dining you can imagine. Wine, women, and song. And he's saying here, it didn't satisfy me. I was empty. It's vanity. It's futile. It's worthless. It doesn't mean anything. Having great parties became tiresome. They'd be noisy, and people would be jockeying for his attention. And that's one of the reasons, I'm sure, when he wrote Proverbs, he said in Proverbs 15, 16, and 17, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. In Proverbs 17, 1, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife like thanksgiving so i became great and i excelled more than all who were before me in jerusalem i i enjoyed my feasts i tempered them with discretion i i didn't yield myself completely to to hedonism or what used to be called debauchery i did this uh, while guiding my heart he had said in verse three with wisdom in other words i retained my reasoning through it all And what I was doing was evaluating its results. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I didn't keep from them. I didn't withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. This was my reward from all my labor. I I did all of this without denying myself. Whatever I wanted, I I could have. There are are people that we know of by, perhaps you know them personally, I I can't say that I know anybody exactly like this, but I can tell you, I I see them on the news all the time, Uh, the different people that are spoken of their incredible wealth and all of that. You know, and the Jeff Bezos and and, and Musk and and others like that. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be an Elon Musk. We'll say he's very, very, very wealthy. I don't know how much money he has, but he has a lot. To walk into a, a, a car dealer um, sells Ferraris. And to walk in and say, I, I want it. And the salesman will say, which one? All of them. I can buy them all. It won't even, you know, he could drop a million dollars and he's, he's wasting money and time by bending down to pick it up. I mean, this man has more money than we can imagine. And I'm pretty sure if he had an honest moment, an honest conversation, I'm pretty sure he'd he'd say something similar to what Solomon said in that it doesn't really satisfy. Because what satisfies me now isn't the money, it's the challenge. And there are things like that that people people understand. And so he's saying, I I became frustrated. I, I, I saw pleasure in and of itself, for itself, it was empty. So what did I do? Well, I, I, I returned to considering if wisdom is fully satisfying. You see, drinking and building and, and wealth and unending pleasures, well, they're not. He said, uh, verse 11, I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I toiled, indeed, all was vanity. Grasping for the wind, there's no profit under the sun. And then he says, so, verse 12, I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king only what he's already done? So he's contrasting madness and folly to see if wisdom is more satisfying. He'd be especially speaking of the world's wisdom. So we ask the question, what can the man do who succeeds the king only what's already been done? Uh, What I'm going to accomplish is duplicating what has been done. And that would include that the fact that the, the previous king is dead. And because the previous king is dead, I'm going to die also. So, verse 13, I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. So, madness and folly are disposed of, as he's saying, wisdom excels folly. Now, wisdom alone, he's saying, doesn't make us happy. But it does excel the folly of vain pleasure. Why is that? Well, light is more beneficial than dark. On the outside, folly may seem acceptable, but it's actually simply a life of darkness. 
And he illustrates this. This is an interesting phrase. Look at verse 14. He says, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. That's an interesting phrase. The wise man's eyes are in his head. The first time I ever heard that saying wasn't in the Bible. The first time I ever heard that phrase was in a song. And it wasn't sung by a believer. It was sung by John Lennon. Ancient history again. One more tip of the hat to the Beatles this time. They had a song called The Fool on a Hill. And it says, day after day alone on a hill, the man with the foolish grin is keeping perfectly still, but nobody wants to know him. They can see that he's just a fool, and he never gives an answer. But the fool on the hill sees the sun going down, and the eyes in his head see the world spinning round. That's a biblical phrase. That's what Solomon was saying right here when he speaks concerning the wise man's eyes are in his head. It's a way of saying that a wise man walks with clear understanding. The wise man can see pitfalls. He can see possible problems on the path that he's taking. But the one who is a fool walks in darkness. In John 11, verse 10, Jesus said it like this. If one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light's not in him. Because he's not walking in the light, he walks in the darkness, and in the darkness you'll always stumble. So the one who's been enlightened by God sees the pitfalls and avoids them. There may be a lust of the flesh. There may be a lust of the eyes. There may be a pride of life. And we're aware of these kinds of things as believers. Our eyes are in our head. We see the things that are going to result. It may seem right now, for example, that if I do that thing, whatever it may be, that I'm going to enjoy myself. But a man with experience, somebody who's gone through something, knows that that doesn't always lead to the pleasure you think it will. Like that guy who picked up a girl in the bar, took her home for, for the night. She got up earlier than he did. He heard the door close as she left. Didn't even know her name. Didn't even really know her. Just picked her up in a bar. When he gets up, he goes to his bathroom and on the bathroom mirror, she had written with her lipstick, Welcome to the wonderful world of AIDS. What he thought was just a night turned out to be his death. And somewhere along the line, we have to learn from the experiences we go through. And those of us who have grown and, and gone through things, we can say things aren't always what they seem. Things aren't always turning out the way we thought they would. If I work this hard or I do this or if I sacrifice that and we end up by ourselves. My dad had a friend that he used to work with. And my dad had four brats. Actually, three brats and me. <laughs> and my mom told me one day, she said, you know, your dad has a friend who travels the world. Now, my father was in the Navy. He traveled the world. And he had the traveling bug in him. My dad wanted to travel. Mama didn't, so they didn't. But he was jealous of this guy at work because the guy at work would speak to my father and say, let me show you some of the pictures I took while I was in Rome. Let me show you some of the pictures I took when I, and he, I traveled the world. And my, my mom said that every time this guy would bring his pictures to show my dad, my dad would get upset. Why? Because he had four brats and a wife that he had to take care of. She says, you want to hear something, David? And I said, what, Mama? She said, the man walked up to your dad one day and spoke to him. You see, the man's wife, the one he traveled the world with, died. Left him by himself. She said, you know what this man just told your dad? And I said, what's that? I envy you, Frank. You've got four kids. You have children that you can look at and say, that I produced. He said, I have nothing but an empty house. I traveled the world. I saw a lot. But the one I traveled with is now no longer with me. See, the things you see as valuable now, later on you're going to discover they're not. 
And you may sometimes feel bad. Man, I wish I could. I should have if I would have. No. You know, if you're wise in the way that you live, you invest in the things that matter. And Solomon's saying a wise man's eyes are in his head. He see the, sees the things in the future. He sees things before him. But a fool walks in darkness and he stumbles because he doesn't have the wisdom to see those things. So for us as believers, we, we know that God is the one who provides light for us. In Psalm 18, 28, the psalmist said it like this. He said, you will light my lamp. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. So what happens? Well, verse 14, he says, uh, the same event happens to them all. Be, uh, both the, the, the fool and the worldly wise go through pain, and both of them ultimately die. So, verse 15, I said, in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? I said in my heart, this also is vanity. Now, both the wise man and the fool die, and, and both are soon forgotten. Time has a way of erasing everything that we've done, both the evil as well as the good. Psalm 49.10 says, All can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. We all die. There's one way, it was one thing, you know, waiting us all. You know, that's not the most cheery thought, but it's true. I've said this to you before when I was just before, I, not just before, a couple of years before I got saved. I was driving with some friends. We were in Whittier. My drug of choice, because it was easy to get and it was very, for me, recreational, my drug of choice was, was uh, smoking weed. And we were smoking weed. I still remember when we were driving, it was raining. And my two friends were in the front seat. I was sitting alone in the back, and I was very high. And as we're driving, I said, you know what, guys? What? We're not living. We're dying. They didn't like hearing that. They said, man, you're a buzzkill. What are you doing? Why are you saying that? I said, because I'm thinking about it. You know, from them, and I went into this philosophic thing. I'm 18. What do I know? But I said, you know, from the time we were conceived in our mother's womb until this moment, every single day we think we're alive, we're actually moving towards death. They never got high with me again, but it was true. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. So what are we doing to prepare? See, that's the kind of thing. Not, marijuana didn't do that to me. It didn't make me think these things. To be honest with you, I didn't get wise through smoking pot or dropping acid. I didn't. It just made me start thinking about where's my life going and why am I doing this? And I came to that conclusion that I'm empty. I have no purpose. I'm just passing through and I'll never impact anybody. I have no reason to be alive. I have no excuse for living. I came to that conclusion and it was true. Because without God, all is vanity. I didn't know that. I simply knew I'm lost. That's what brought me to faith in Christ. What happens to the fool happens to the one who is worldly wise. They both die. That's a fact. And so, it's all vanity. Why was I, verse 15, more wise? This also is vanity. The pursuit of the wisdom of the world hasn't resulted in peace or contentment. Worldly wisdom didn't exempt me from, from pain. What good is it? Well, he says in verse 17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me for all this vanity, grasping for the wind. I hated life because it didn't offer lasting satisfaction. This is where so many are today, hating life but not wanting to die. Again, here's another old. I was in a music mood, forgive me. Another old one by Sam Cooke. Change is going to come. It's been too hard living. I'm afraid to die. I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. That's a biblical thought. It's hard living, but I don't want to die. I don't, for him, I don't know what's waiting me. That's the person who has it all and had nothing. And so... 
What does he do? Well, he says in verse 18, I hated all my labor in which I had to toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he'll rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. It's vanity. I'm working myself to death. I'll die. I'll leave behind everything I work for. And somebody who didn't work a day in his life for this is going gonna, is gonna to receive it. What good is it? I'm not satisfied with all that I've accumulated. I actually, I'm actually frustrated. The fruit of my work is going to be left to someone who didn't work for it. I remember my kids when they were in high school. Uh, a couple of my kids said this to me. I'll never forget. They, they talked to me and they said this. They said, hey, Dad. My friend is rich, a 14-year-old kid. My friend is rich, and, and I always had the same answer. I said, no, his parents are. The kid isn't. Parents are. Now, he's not speaking about, by the way, proper stewardship. Obviously, we leave things behind for our children. Proverbs 13.22 says, A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. A sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. I've made a, and I'll say this quickly, I encourage every person here who's able to put even a little bit away, and this is not the, the heart of the ser sermon, I'm just kind of sharing this with you, just briefly. Um, I think it's wise, if you can, to save. My dad taught me that. I think it's wise to do that. We used to call it for the rainy day. You know, I think it's wise to do that, and I've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, so that should the Lord take me home, then I, and I just talked to my kids about this recently. I said, if he, when he takes me home, and more than likely before, he, before my, my, my wife goes, I'll go. I told my kids, I don't want you taking care of your mother. That's my job. That's what I do. That's what men do for their families and for their wives. That's what I do. And I don't want you kids to feel obligated to have to take care of your mother when her husband should have done that for her. And I, I believe that with all of my heart. And so one of my kids said, well, Dad, you know, you ought to spend some on yourself. Spend it on something you like. And I said, I am. I'm spending it on your mom because I like her. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Proverbs 13, 22, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. A sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. It is right to leave something behind for your kids. It's proper stewardship. And doing so is wise. It can be an investment in eternity. So you leave things behind in your will for your children, your trust, for your charities, whatever. But why was he in a state of despair? It's because he knew that he couldn't keep what he worked so hard to get. He couldn't protect it from somebody who was going to waste it. So in verse 19, uh, who knows whether he's going to be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I told and in which I've shown myself wise under the sun. This is vanity. Therefore, I turned my heart and, and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. Somebody is going to end up with all my efforts. <laughs> they could care less about it. They, they don't know what it took to gain these riches, and they'll just spend it and won't think. He said, that's vanity. There is a man, verse 21, whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who hasn't labored for it. This is vanity, a great evil. For what has a man, what has man for all his labor and, and for the striving of his heart? with which he's toiled under the sun. All his days are sorrowful, his work burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. It's also his vanity. We can have sleepless nights, concerned about those things, but our heirs never experience it. You can worry about, well, what's going to happen? And when you worry about that, it brings misery. What are they going to do with the money I left them? Will they be wise? Are they just going to spend it? You know, at one time, you know, when we were putting together a living trust and all, I, this is 20-some years ago, I told the guy who was doing the work, I said, I'm, gonna, I said, I'm not going to have them receive everything in, bulks, in, in, in bulk. I said, you're going to divvy it out to them. 
because you give it to my, my son David, he'll be driving a Ferrari the next day. <laughs> if he can. No, you have to be aware of those kinds of things. So what's he, what's he come up to? Verse 24, nothing's better for a man than they should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. For who can eat? Or who can have enjoyment more than I? For God gives wisdom and knowledge and, and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who's good before God. This also is vanity, grasping for the wind. So life, he says, is a gift from God. What's evil is having blessings of life and, and not enjoying them. He says in verse 26, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who's good. And well, God desires to give wisdom. God desires to give us knowledge, and, and he wants us to have joy. He, he wants us to enjoy working. He wants us to produce the great works. He, he, he wants us to enjoy the pleasures that we can have, the pleasures of marriage, of parenthood, if you will. He wants us to have financial security. Why? Because he wants to bless us. As we serve him, he wants that for us. But not so, he says, with the sinner. Why is that? Well, they left God out. Ultimately, their lives are toil and no rest. That's what happens. Again, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So enjoyment of life always will find at its center a relationship with God. Psalm 116, verse 7, Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You can put your head on your pillow at night and you can rest. Why? Because, because you're walking with the Lord. And whatever has come into your life, and I'll close it with this thought, whatever has come into your life up to this point has had to, had to go through one thing first, and that is the will of God. That is one of the more deep lessons that you're going to learn as a believer because there are things that we may experience that we do not see the value of now we just don't see it because all we can see at the moment is the difficulty that we may be experiencing and oh I've worked so hard it doesn't seem like anything results but I can tell you God makes it good. When you take care of the things he gives you, he produces fruit in your life. My son, my son's son, my son, grandson, David, David Aaron Jr. got some seeds. And he said, let's plant these seeds, Papa. And I said, sure, why not? So I got a little small pot, threw some dirt in it, took his seeds put the seeds in it, covered it up with dirt, watered it, put it in the sun, left it there. About four or five, six weeks later, he walks up and says, are my seeds growing? <laughs> They're dead. Why? Well, you got to take care of them. You got to water them. They don't just grow up by themselves. And you know what? I think that's a lesson you learn in life. You take care of the things that God gave to you. You use them according to his will. You invest those things in other people. You may not see the fruit of it immediately because it takes time for the seeds to produce. But one day they do. And one day you reap the benefits and the pleasures and the joys of the labor well, you sowed and you watered, but God gave the increase. And in your life, it's very similar. A life without God is going to prove to be without meaning. But a life that is centered on the Lord, even though you may go through difficult times, you're going to come to the conclusion to fear God and to serve him with all that you have. Why? Because what was meant at one time, perhaps, to be evil, 
what you've gone through that has been so hurtful that you don't think you can survive it. You put your head on your pillow at night and you can hardly breathe. You're in such turmoil and grief and sorrow. One day later on is going to prove to be something God uses in you to make you into the person you wanted to be all along. And what you may have used, what may have been something you cried about and heard about and sorrowed over, God can turn that around. Because God can teach you to see him in the midst of all the futility that's in the world. See, in the world, there's nothing but vanity. But in God, there's purpose. And that's what Solomon is telling us bit by bit, little here, a little there. I've done all of these things, and I found, and he'll say at the end, without God, it was nothing. But now I know him. I know him in a deeper way. And I can tell you, it's all centered on him. And we'll see that as we go through chapter by chapter, as you go through so many different things that we'll identify with. And incidentally, next week, as we get into chapter 3, it'll be another old song that you'll have a chance to see. <laughs> <laughs>